world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spying was very much part of the Cold War. and how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, Mutually Assured Destruction. In part eight of Mad World, upheaval spreads like wildfire across Europe. She didn't manage to get down in time and they shot her in the stomach, dead. The push for freedoms in the East were very touchy. A new era begins to emerge, and brutal barriers are broken down. I am happy that this is open here. This was the important point. As a global superpower cracks apart, thousands of Tatsik stoned, burned, and looted. Official denials. Many thousands are paying the price of the Cold War. Their demands are basic for food, for medicine, for a place to die. But there is an end in sight for the turmoil. A sense of optimism about the future. Oh my God, the world is our oyster. June 1989. The Soviet Union has been defeated in Afghanistan. The USA is spending billions of dollars on a space-age defense against nuclear weapons. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is relaxing the rules at home. As the decade draws to a close, it looks as though the USSR is becoming less of a threat. But some of the Eastern Bloc countries have become more brutal than their Soviet masters. Refugees plunge into the Danube hoping to reach the Yugoslav patrol boats or swim to the far shore. Many don't make it. Their bodies are washed up against the dams where the Romanians collect them to bury them in mass graves. Romania, a brutal dictator, has been ruling for 24 years. My wife was three months pregnant when we crossed. She shouted, look out. I threw myself on the ground. She didn't manage to get down in time, and they shot her in the stomach, dead. The country's leader is Nikolai Ceausescu. He has inherited a police state. Dissent is punished by imprisonment, and worse. They continually tortured me. I was kept in isolation. Everyone who tries to cross the frontier is considered a traitor. They kicked my teeth out. All Romanians are expected to conform to Ceausescu's edicts. Ceausescu's critics say he wants to destroy everything that is individual about the people of Romania. Villages around Bucharest have already been destroyed as part of Ceausescu's scheme to eliminate rural identity. The people of the village of Christian have been told that they're on the list for demolition. The economy is in meltdown. In the countryside, malnutrition among pregnant women and children is common. A country that was once the richest in Central Europe is now reduced to the level of the poorest developing nations. These pictures, taken by a hidden camera, show people queuing for hours for the most basic foods. December 1989. The country cracks under the pressure. Romania's revolution was triggered in Transylvania, where nearly two million ethnic Hungarians live. In Timisoara, a minor protest snowballs into mass riots. The army is ordered to take control. They open fire. 
Many are killed, but the mood for change has not been quashed. Other communist states start to simmer with revolution. These demonstrations took place just one year ago, filmed by an underground group. They were stopped by riot police. After 40 years of oppression, Hungary is the first country to push back. Then another joins. An electrician is organizing resistance in Poland. Fate made him a lucky survivor. Born poor, the charismatic strike leader was irrepressible in breaking the communist hold on Poland's trade unions and founding solidarity. Lech Walesa created solidarity in 1980 in a shipyard in Gdansk. The name will come to symbolize the fundamental changes about to erupt across Eastern Europe. Well, anyone who'd witnessed the Hungarian uprising and its quashing and the subsequent intolerance for any kind of dissent within the region um, had to be nervous about what was happening in Poland. The push for freedoms in the East were very touchy. There were a couple of times where I think uh, the potential for some form of conflict in Eastern Europe was uh, actually pretty high. Then Poland openly defies communist dictatorship. Elections for a democratic government are held. The Soviet military is on alert. Gorbachev tells his tanks to stand down. the Eastern Bloc country votes in an unlikely president. Backed by an overwhelming vote of confidence, Poland's first elected president, Lech Wałęsa, swept through the gates of the Lenin shipyard in Gdańsk to pay homage to his beginnings. Warmth and encouragement engulfed the former electrician who throughout the long and turbulent election campaign had invoked the aspirations of the workers. It was a, a pretty heroic enterprise by those who were, were pushing the solidarity movement and uh, was a remarkable watershed. He won their support, now he must deliver the promises. Communism has been derailed in Poland. The ripples are spreading fast across the Eastern Bloc. In Hungary, the Communist Party itself is riding the wave of greater freedom. Neither John nor Joseph thought they would ever see each other again. It's a sign of the tremendous change in Hungary within the past few months that such a meeting can take place. About three months ago, it wasn't possible for me to come here to this country. And now entering Hungary with you, uh, I see a sign for a better sort of situation. The government even rewrites the story of the Hungarian leader who 40 years ago, they executed. 300,000 people in Heroes Square, Budapest to mourn the man who was prime minister during the dramatic days of 1956, the symbol of their struggle for freedom. Imre Nodj, hanged as a traitor in 58, was finally laid to rest as a hero. For thousands of Hungarian refugees, it was an emotional homecoming. This year at last, Nodge's family and his people poured out the emotions which had been forbidden for so long. My experience is the people are the same Hungarians like before. They are polite, they are nice. The Hungarian people, freedom-loving people. But the fear is still here until this government is gone. But as in Poland, Soviet tanks do not invade. Within a year, John will have nothing to fear.
a center-right party wins the election. Communism has been voted out of power in Hungary. Almost difficult to believe that the Hungarians, a small country in, uh, in a big Soviet orbit, uh, were prepared to rise up against one of the most powerful forces, superpowers, uh, in the history of the world. Uh, Hungarians were, were seen as heroes. The picture of the whole of Eastern Europe moving away from the Soviet sphere of domination and giving up on socialism, which was imposed on them, I think is instructive. So as soon as anybody can get away, uh, they run away. And we've supported those efforts with a substantial aid package to Poland, trade benefits for Hungary. Important decisions have been made for freedom or reforms. As two nations race away from communism, a strange footnote on Hungary. The new free market leads to a boom in a specialized sector of the economy. Riding the crest of the sex boom is Hungary's self-styled king of porn, Laszlo Voros. Voros epitomizes the Hungarian who's confused capitalism with the idea of money at all costs. As long as it's profitable for me, I will stay. This kind of business will be running well for a couple of years because this kind of entertainment was forbidden until now. A former optician, Christina now has a new focus in life. I'm not worried about earning my living with my body. I have a good body. Like most other aspects of capitalism, the vice trade in Hungary is about pleasing the customer. And in the end, boils down to just one thing, that very Western notion of money. The USA has just elected a new president. The course of the Cold War is in the hands of George H.W. Bush. What conditions would have to be met for you to have a summit with uh, uh, Gorbachev, and do you expect to have one in 1989? It's interesting because there's a lot of hope now, a lot of anticipation. We don't want to dash the hopes, but I don't want to raise them to unrealistic heights. Your attitude uh, towards the Soviet Union seems to have shifted a bit uh, since you became president, from deep skepticism to seeming acceptance of their intentions. I don't think it's shifted as much as you think, Michael. I don't think it's shifted as much. Despite the softer Soviet approach in Europe, Bush is expected to maintain the U.S. hardline attitude. In dealing with the Soviet Union, I am going to continue to keep my eyes wide up, wide open. I will also say, I want to see Perestroika succeed. I want to see it succeed, not fail. Perestroika sums up Gorbachev's vision for the Soviet Union. It stands for restructuring and is already creating a more open economy and government friendly to the West. Bang, there it was on the table, restructuring, openness. And that, again, had its own unstoppable logic. Once you set that genie out of the bottle, um, there, was no, there was no going back. Everybody was intrigued right around the world with perestroika, this language, these concepts coming from the Russian leadership. It did seem quite remarkable. Perestroika is creating remarkable events which would have been unthinkable only a couple of years earlier. Gorbachev holds elections in the USSR itself. The radical new president can now be voted out. It's a sight that both excites and frightens those in the Soviet Union. For the first time in 70 years, the Soviet leadership was allowing multi-candidate elections for a powerful body. President Mikhail Gorbachev knows that he's taken a risk. Those seeking greater reform are excited. Tensions mount as the name of the new president is announced. Will the man who has taken the USSR back from the brink of the Cold War be thrown out of office? The results send waves of exhilaration across the globe. Mikhail Gorbachev is the first freely elected president of the Soviet Union. 
Well, I became foreign minister in 1988 and remained so through to 1996. So I was there during the whole end game of the Cold War and in that huge period of excitement about the, the possibilities of a world you know, without that tension and the possibilities of cooperation at last between uh, Russia and the United States and the Security Council and elsewhere. The new president is building bridges with France, West Germany, and the UK. George Bush makes a move. It is my great honor to welcome to the White House the President of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Mr. President, the eyes of the world are on you, and they are on President Bush. Our nations have the responsibility to leave behind not only the Cold War, but also the conflicts that preceded it. Talks between the two superpower presidents are headline news. The walls which for years separated the peoples are collapsing. The trenches of the Cold War are disappearing. The fog of prejudice, mistrust, and animosity is vanishing. Personal relationships also seem to be warming up. President Bush, how was the meeting? Just a minute, wait till I get out of this. <laughs> Without them and the risks that they were willing to take, none of this would have happened as remotely, as seamlessly as it did or when it did. The only thing that went wrong is I pride myself as a uh, horseshoe player, and uh, President Gorbachev picked up the horseshoe, never having played the game to my knowledge, and literally, literally threw a ringer the first time. By 89-90, you, you had a Soviet Union that was theoretically undergoing perestroika and all that kind of stuff, so he thought, well, these guys aren't that bad, we can look well. If the citizens of the United States had any doubts about the Soviet leader's charm, they were dispelled by this spontaneous walkabout on the streets of Washington. Formal occasions add further sparkle to the talks. We meet at a time of great and historic change in the Soviet Union, in Europe, and around the world. Such profound change is unsettling, but also Exhilarating. Yes, indeed, we used to be enemies or almost enemies. Now we are maybe rivals, at least to some extent. And uh, we want to become partners. We want to go all the way to become friends. The Russians also host a party at their Washington embassy. On the menu is chicken Kiev and caviar. Food, wine, and friendship are flowing. And you know, Americans and Soviets have often tended to think of our two countries as being on opposite sides of almost everything, including the opposite sides of the world. But we share an important northern border, and we are, in fact, next-door neighbors across the Bering Sea. World-changing agreements are drawn up to break down trade barriers and reduce nuclear arms. about to sign agreements concerning many areas of vital interest to our countries and to the world. I would say that maybe this room has seen many important events and many agreements signed, but I think that what is happening now and what you have uh, listed as the results of our work together represents an event of momentous importance not only for our two countries but for the world. And I would like also to shake your hand, Mr. President, so that we congratulate each other. Within six months, a remarkable meeting takes place in Paris. Agreements are made on international security and cooperation. 34 nations are represented. They are from the East and the West. The Cold War is rushing to the finish line. The Iron 
curtain dividing East and West is opening under the pressure for change. But not all Eastern Bloc nations are relaxing the reins. East Germany is keeping the doorway to freedom firmly closed. Further south, the first break in the barbed wire border appears when the Hungarians fail to maintain the fence. There was a barbed wire fence, a bit rusty, and with a large hole in it. We crawled through it, and there was a sign which said, Austria. It's the most wonderful day of my life. By August, more than 6,000 had slipped quietly out of Hungary, threading through the vineyards and into Austria, and the hope of a new way of life. One catalyst for change has been a process for East-West understanding, called détente. But with détente, relations have warmed, and in May, part of the Iron Curtain fell along the Austro-Hungarian border. The trickle through the fence dividing Hungary from Austria becomes a flow. Most of the refugees are from one country, East Germany. The open frontier became a magnet for those disenchanted with communism. Throughout the summer, East Germans in particular have gone south to go west. Guards foiled some would-be refugees, but lines of abandoned cars suggest most escapes were successful. A sense of euphoria builds as more and more people from Eastern Bloc countries travel to freedom in the West. I think the future for East Germany is black with the communist uh, administration. And what do you think is your future in the West? The future? It will be better. The Hungarians make little effort to stop the mass defections. Holiday trips to Budapest have turned into the journey of a lifetime. Refugee camps spring up around Budapest. Hungary is running out of capacity to cope with the numbers. This is no solution to an international problem. We are not politicians. Politicians have to find a solution to this problem. We only do the humanitarian help. East Germany rushes to close the border with Hungary. But people are now fleeing to embassies and airports in Czechoslovakia and Poland. Bonn provides any East German with automatic citizenship. And so West Germany is their intended destination. But swamped by the flood of applications, several of its embassies in Eastern Europe have had to close their doors in order to cope with the mounting backlog. Trains and planes arrive in West Germany packed with refugees from the East. West Germany, too, must prepare to cope. Its Red Cross is mounting the largest refugee operation since the Second World War. They're not like refugees at all. It's like they have always been here, meaning the moment they cross the border, they get citizenship, passport, pension rights. They get social uh, council housing has allocated them, job retraining, uh, even unemployment insurance. Then a cataclysmic event in East Germany is caused by a simple miscommunication. November the 9th, 1989. At a confused press conference, a Soviet minister named Shabowski is about to say the wrong thing under pressure. The 9th of November, the meeting, the conference, was just like any other conference. No one expected anything spectacular to happen. Politburo member Shabowski made the statement that travel to the West will be permitted. The press was very aggressive and wanted to know when. When will that start? He couldn't remember, so he shuffled through his papers and he came across a draft that was not approved. But he said, right now. And the rest is history.
border guards, known for their murderous behavior, refused to shoot escaping East Germans. I was in Berlin just a few days after the wall was breached, and there's a wonderful photograph of me with my hand through the wall, shaking an East German border guards. I am happy that this is opened here. This was the important point of old Berlin. Here was it where the traffic flow over, and still it will be an important traffic point. West Berlin mayor, Walther Mumper, will be the first mayor of a reunited Berlin. Do you know when the Brandenburg Gate may be opened? <laughs> no, but they will let me know when they will open it. They will let you know. Within three days, bulldozers are brought in and the ultimate symbol of the Cold War divide comes crashing down. Fall of the Berlin Wall causes jubilation, both in Germany and around the world. Yeah, the atmosphere was absolutely indescribable. The sense of optimism about the future. My God, what's you know, what can we do now? The world is the world is our oyster. Many of you had not even been born when the Berlin Wall was erected in 1961. The Iron Curtain came down. It was an incredible sense of peace and a sense of danger that had lessened. As Iron Curtain borders are removed across Eastern Europe, the Romanian dictator tries to keep hold of his power. Crowds that used to cower under Ceausescu now feel free to jeer. The army is known for firing on its own people. This time, they do nothing. The dictator and his wife try to escape. They fail. Christmas Day, 1989. Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu are executed by firing squad. The most brutal regime in the Eastern Bloc is no more. Romania begins its long journey to recovery. That entire civilization, whether it was Russia, Ukraine, Romania, you know, that whole region had never known democracy. In the Soviet Union itself, the new freedoms are not working quickly enough. Every day, refugees gather outside government buildings, pleading for homes and food. Every day, the answer's the same. They're told the city's resources are already overstretched. Many have moved to work as hostels on the outskirts of Moscow. Five families to a room, some people have been here for two years. Their demands are basic, for food, for medicine, for a place to die. The Russian economy is barely able to produce enough to feed the people. Experts have called it a war economy, which can finance satellites and missiles, but can't produce enough soap, meat or other products. They were really spending 40, 50 percent of their, their GDP on, on military stuff, which was robbing their civilian economy of any future, finally was what broke the back of the Soviet Union. The Soviet economy has been crippled by the Cold War. As a symbol of Gorbachev's commitment to disarmament, tanks were turned into plows. Gorbachev believes in restructuring, but only so far. He is fighting to keep the USSR a communist state. He also desperately needs to modernize his country's industrial base. And for that, he needs Western help, and especially Western technology. There were 
certain diplomatic overtures that were already starting to occur, where it was very clear that the Soviet Union was, was not going to survive. Gorbachev hits the road again, this time not to give up weapons, but to ask for economic support. London, where the flags were out for the leaders of the world's seven richest nations. After a three-month campaign of appeals to individual Western leaders, an invitation had been extended to the Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, to present his case for aid. Arriving in the heartland of capitalism, and despite the Soviet parliament's backing for his economic reform plan, Gorbachev knew that many had criticized his visit to beg for foreign help. The USSR is a nation of nearly 300 million people. Once the iron fist of central control is lifted, no one knows what will happen. It is a difficult and novel task to build a new civilization. Our own house is in need of an overhaul and a fundamental restructuring along the lines of reason and justice. We are aware of the magnitude of this undertaking unprecedented in the history of mankind. Russia is about to face a second revolution in less than a century. In Estonia, two of the main nationalist leaders, Edgar Savistar and Mariu Loristans, were elected with reform-minded party candidates. In Lithuania, the party leader won his seat, but the local president lost his. The independence movement did particularly well. In most places, the race for independence is angry and violent. Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, saw at least 20 die in a peaceful nationalist demonstration when the troops moved in. Ukrainian miners, too, called the Kremlin to account with a series of devastating strikes. And people are now fighting to defend their right to choose their own destiny. And that was everywhere. People came out on the street, ordinary men and women, who were willing to, you know, stand in front of the tanks. Too many players hungry to get out from under the sort of centralized yoke to take advantage of the emerging situation. And too many people in the West and elsewhere pressing them to do just that uh, because of their concern about, well, their desire to make sure that, you know, the Soviet Union wouldn't rise up again in any new guise. Gorbachev cracks down on the rebellions. the violence gets worse. Communists are under siege. There appears to be no retreat. For four days, thousands of Tadziks stoned, burned, and looted. As Soviet central power weakens, ancient rivals fight for territory. In the Soviet Union's southern republics, the call of Islam is becoming louder. The ancient city of Samarkand in Uzbekistan retains an outward calm but it too has ethnic riots. Most goods from other parts of the Soviet Union would usually come by train through Azerbaijan. But in August, rail workers there introduced a blockade, apparently in an attempt to starve Armenia into dropping its claim to Nagorno-Karabakh. After numerous violent clashes between the two sides, the region now stands on the brink of civil war. In hospital, a man with 12 bullet wounds in his head lies dying. He was guarding a factory which was attacked. It's the kind of unrest that threatens Mikhail Gorbachev's grand plans for a national rebirth. In the North, despite peaceful elections, the old Soviet style of oppression rears its head. Rumors grow that the order to attack demonstrators in Lithuania has come from Moscow. Then there is no doubt. Pictures of people shot by soldiers and run over by tanks are smuggled out of the country. Despite the violence, Lithuania manages to hold peaceful elections. The February election resulted in a landslide victory for the Soyuz party. Its main pledge was to secede from the Soviet Union and retake the independence which had been lost half a century ago. If Lithuania is allowed to go its own way, it could be the first step in the breakup of the Soviet Union. 
Lithuania is the first former Soviet Socialist Republic to declare itself an independent nation. August 1991, alarming reports are heard from Moscow. While Gorbachev is overseas, the communist old guard stages a coup. While we're still watching the situation unfold, and it still is unfolding, all is not clear, it seems clearer all the time that contrary to official statements out of uh, Moscow, that this move was extra-constitutional, outside of the constitutional provisions for governmental change. Uh, clearly, it's a disturbing development, There's no question about that. And it could have uh, serious consequences uh, for the Soviet society and in Soviet relations with other countries, including the United States. When the Russian president returns, he is held under house arrest. Another ambitious politician stands up to the coup leaders, Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin became the most visible symbol of those bucking the system. The insider turned outsider attracted a huge following with his populist politics. People actually fought to get a chance to hear him at his public meetings. The military claim Gorbachev is ill. The coup, only 72 hours old, was crumbling. Troops were withdrawn from Moscow center. The coup leaders were placed under arrest. For Mikhail Gorbachev, although never really ill, being held captive in his holiday dasher for three days took its toll. Yeltsin is not a communist. He wants Russia to become a free market economy. Yeltsin's promise to encourage free debate, if elected, made him popular. I think a lot of Moscowites um, see in his person one of the enemies of bureaucracy. He tells the truth. He tells the truth. Everybody is speaking about. On the 21st of December, 1991, the document that ends the Cold War is signed, the Alma-Ata Protocol. The latest crisis, the signing of an historic agreement between the three mighty republics, Ukraine, Russia, and Bielorussia, effectively marked the formal death of the USSR and ended Gorbachev's personal vision of a wider political union. The mighty superpower, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, is no more. And what would have seemed inconceivable only weeks before, the Communist Party was not only losing its position of power, but being disbanded. But the roots of the Communist Revolution run deep. Vladimir Lenin, the original Russian revolutionary, has surviving relatives, including Olga Ilyanova. It's our history, our culture. They're trying to throw away a whole chapter. You just can't do that. Just because they didn't like Napoleon in France, they can't pretend he didn't exist. He did, and so did Lenin. Those comments from Lenin's surviving niece reflect a minority view in the new allegiance of sovereign states. Olga Ilyanova, holding this photograph of herself as a child with her uncle, sees little comfort in the future. She laments a union that's passed and fears a disunity that may be lurking around the corner. When the Soviet Union disintegrated, the first reaction of myself personally and most people was one of joy because a threat had been removed and all that money spent on weapons could be spent for better reasons. Well, the appeal of egalitarianism, the appeal of absolute redistribution is immense and universal, but of course that was something that might have been theoretically part of the original communist ideal. But once, under the Leninist and subsequent traditions, the judgment was made that that nirvana could only be achieved through the leadership of an authoritarian party. That ideal essentially completely collapsed. Some refugees from communism in other parts of the world are still not able to return home. I escaped the regime. I escaped tyranny. I escaped dictatorship. I'm a man of principle. I don't come back. 
because basically it's still the same. Still a monopoly of power there. I don't like it. After a 70-year experiment, Russia's communist rule has ended. The Cold War is over. Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who survived the August coup and changed the course of post-war history, was now a president without a union. On Christmas Day, 1991, the man who brought about the end of the Cold War walks away. The new president of Russia is Boris Yeltsin. The end of the Cold War was barely felt by many in the West. The Cold War in many ways is misnamed. It was a very hot war. Think about it. You had Korea, Vietnam, an innumerable number of skirmishes in Africa, Central America. Contrary to popular belief, a lot of lives were lost. Millions of people died. Countries were destroyed and decimated. If you have a, a war and a bunch of people get killed, you certainly appreciate peace for a long time, just like we do when we come back from a war and everybody wants to just be left alone and they don't want to see another war for 50 years. That's the people. The leaders are not necessarily that way because they're not, they're not getting killed. For many escaped dissidents from the East, the end of the USSR comes too late. 30 years earlier, one of the Soviet Union's Olympic hopefuls made a dangerous decision. My escape was one of the very, very few that attracted the death penalty on charges of high treason. I was a college uh, student and a swimming champion, a batting champion. I was then drafted into the army. Pyotr Patrushev is stationed by the Black Sea on the Turkish border he decides to swim for freedom. They were really upset because they spent literally billions on, on safeguarding the border. Patrol boats, uh, overhead planes, submarines, radar devices, sonar devices, and so it's supposed to be completely impenetrable. And those who swam, as I finally did, across the Black Sea, a corner of Black Sea, would mostly drown. And one particular night when you had to just choose your wave height right not too much not too little because otherwise the searchlights would pick you up if it's too placid if it's too rough you'll never make it it's a 30 to 35 kilometers swim through very rough waters with cold currents if anything is moving in one direction, they know it's not a dolphin or whatever, you know, they will go, in fact, and drop a depth charge in that area, which would kill every living thing within like three to four square kilometers. After two nights, Pyotr crosses the border. I was just unbelievably lucky. I was a good swimmer, and I had flippers, which give, give you a lot of speed, but uh, to swim that kind of distance with those obstacles, lots of people tried, and none succeeded. So I, I just made it the second night only by coming out on the Turkish shore. That was happy moment, very happy moment. But his freedom comes at a price. I was put on a KGB's wanted list for 27 years. I was on the KGB's wanted list, it means I could be list. You know, and my life was kind of cut into half by separating such brutal and sudden separation with my, my country, my language, my family. Working as a journalist and interpreter, Pyotr had a unique insight to both sides of the Cold War. Six months after this interview, Pyotr passed away. That's what you've got to kind of realize, that there is not only a huge amount of repression that you live under, the, under in those regimes, but that is kind of almost psychopathic kind of personalities. If you look at, you know, Lenin, Trotsky, you know, and, and perhaps even Putin now, you know, you really realize they're not your average leader of the world, you know, they've got quirks, you know. Five communist countries remain today. The most restricted 
has changed little since the proxy war of the 1950s. 50 years ago, Mr. Xi manned a gun just like this one. North Korea, not known for welcoming visitors, but an exception is made for Chinese veterans from the Korean War. The late Kim Il-sung, or great leader, ruled the country from its establishment in 1948 until his death 46 years later, a record in the communist world. Kim Il-sung's grandson now rules the country. Kim Jong-un is a hardline communist dictator, a living embodiment of the Cold War. Even under the watchful gaze of the late great leader, the capital is dark and quiet, as capitals go. The former soldiers are here to pay tribute to their fallen colleagues. Mr. Xi was one of the first to cross the Yalu in October 1950 to support beleaguered North Koreans. But this is what Mr. Xi came to see. It's the memorial to the Chinese who fought in Korea. Mr. Xi made it back home, but 380,000 of his compatriots didn't. Inside the monument, the tourists gather around a book that records the names of Chinese remembered for their courage. It was a particularly harsh and bitter conflict fought to a stalemate that drags on today. North Korea is still technically at war with the United Nations forces. The document that ended the Korean War was an armistice, not a peace treaty. The Chinese coach party is taken to a place where the ongoing tension between North Korea and the West is most obvious. The tourists are gathering to visit the demilitarized zone, the Cold War's final frontier. The border between North and South Korea is very rarely crossed by civilians. For almost half a century, border guards have carefully watched and waited. The paranoia, sense of duty, or perhaps just intrigue, is mutual to both sides. Everyone is watched, always. The greatest fear about North Korea today is that it possesses a nuclear arsenal. The terrible weapon of the Cold War is still very much a threat. Finally, the tour is over. For Mr. Xi, it's been a poignant return to a land he only knew as a soldier. For others, it's good to be back home with their own familiar brand of communism. Communist countries still exist. Nuclear weapons are still armed and ready for action. Is this the start of a new Cold War? By moving the hand of the clock closer to midnight, the BAS Board of Directors is drawing attention to the increasing dangers from the spread of nuclear we weapons in a world of violent conflict that is unfolding. The Cold War as such is over in the sense of two superpowers, you know, really wanting to be absolutely the dominant player on the world stage and intolerant of any kind of physical intrusions into their space or their proxy space around the place. Both sides are implicated in a way, but of course the Soviet side were far more reckless with the human lives and with their kind of gambling than often the West was. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has been indicating the likelihood of global annihilation since they set the hands of this clock to seven minutes to midnight in 1947. The clock has been moved 21 times since then. They are moving the hands of the doomsday clock two minutes closer to midnight. It is now three minutes to midnight. The world is a, is a less secure place, I think, when there were two mighty powers who really ruled the world. It was ugly, but probably more stable. I took the view quite a while back that I wouldn't go back to Cuba until the system changed. I've been waiting now for uh, more than 40, 45 years since we left for, uh, for the system to change. Uh, there are signs of some change, but I'm in no particular hurry to go back. The Cold War followed a time when about 77 million people, almost 3% of the world's population, was wiped out by two world wars. I lived under Adolf Hitler and Nazis and seen the worst of humanity. I seen and lived under Joseph Stalin and witnessed brutality. I also lived under capitalism and 11 U.S. presidents.
And to me, capitalism wins out, hands down. The arms race cost hundreds of billions of dollars. For 45 years, the human race lived in the shadow of the most powerful and terrible weapons ever created. In fear of total annihilation. So I think it's important to try and understand how we were able to survive for 40 or 50 years with the ability to destroy the world, you know, 100 times over and not do it. I think we're so lucky that we came out unscathed. You know, knowing what we know now, we were dead close many times. World War III did not happen. Most of us are probably around today because we were protected by the fear of mad, mutually assured destruction. For all the pessimism that's around, for all the gloom that's around, we have learned something and the world does move on. Having achieved freedom, let's use freedom to resolve conflicts and to as an instrument of development.